Hi there. My name is Abhijit Bhaduri. I work as an executive coach, and I also uh, am the author of this book, Dreamers and Unicorns, where one of the things that I've talked about is the importance of mental health in the workplace, which is going to become one of the biggest challenges we have ever faced, and is probably going to be bigger than the skills challenge. And to talk about exactly this, I have Dr. Ashwin Nayak, who's a TED fellow and an Ashoka fellow. He's also the founder of uh, Vatsalia Health, which is a series of uh, low-cost hospitals, which is available in the tier two, tier three cities. And that's the work that I most admire him for. So Ashwin, lovely to have you here. Thank you for joining me. And I must say that it's been such a privilege for me to partner with you in building this mental health awareness. Um, and also actually to start talking about well-being, moving beyond mental health. But first question that I wanted to talk about was, people talk about wellness and well-being. People talk about wellness and well-being as two separate pieces. Right. They use it interchangeably. Is that right or is that wrong? Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit, for having me. I think this is a, a great conversation to have. And, uh, uh, you know, while the definitions themselves don't make a big difference, right, uh, wellness or well-being, but it's important to figure out what is the fine distinction between these two. When we talk about wellness, it's typically associated with physical wellness. And well-being is much more than physical well-being. Uh, it also includes your mental, spiritual, uh, societal uh, well-being, for example. Be what it may, uh, I think the, the reason it is important to create this distinction now is because traditionally organizations have focused on the physical wellness part. You know, it's very usual um, over the last 10 years to see companies doing uh, employee well wellness challenges, which include yoga or marathons or uh, fitness challenges, etc. But very recently, only very recently, organizations have started looking at the emotional well-being, which is the, the core element of the well-being piece. So I think that's the shift. So uh, wellness focuses largely on the physical uh, health side and well-being focuses on a more holistic, emotional, social, physical uh, well-being, if you will. Uh, so that's the key difference. So one way I would, uh, uh, you know, remember this difference is to say when we talk about the human being, we are talking about well-being. So that's the yeah. more holistic way to sort of do that. Yeah. Yeah. It just makes it easy for me to remember that difference. Yeah. Um, I also thought that, uh, you know, you raise a very interesting point that, um, you know, physical well-being is just one element of well-being, but it's mental, physical, emotional and spiritual. Uh, you know, yeah. the four axes uh, that you actually have to address. Um, and when you look at that, one of the most important pieces that I have read uh, in the recent times is uh, that more than 80% of the CEOs actually think that this has a direct impact on productivity. Um, and even more uh, interesting was the fact that more than 90% of the CEOs who were surveyed actually talk about the fact that they have sought out help in this particular field for themselves. What do you think is triggering this massive move uh, towards people becoming conscious about well-being? And, uh, you know, what is uh, driving that shift? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, over the last uh, 18 months or so, things have really sort of uh, shifted, right? I mean, we all know the way the world has changed. But if you ask today any progressive CEO, what are the top three things that they think about in terms of their own organization and employees? Uh, my bet is they will say emotional well-being of their employees will be in the top three. And this is not just corporate uh, world, right? If you look at the sports world, the number of athletes who have come out and said emotional well-being is important for me, I'm going to take a pause, right? whether it is Olympic uh, athletes or even closer home, the cricket uh, uh, players. I think the conversation has uh, tilted in the favor of accepting emotional well-being is a key component of well-being. So that's one thing. The second thing is the changing structure of work, hybrid work, remote work, 
<clears throat> has also put a lot of pressure on employee well-being and ceos are uh, recognizing that that this is an important piece and we have to do whatever we have we can to support employee well-being the third one is younger employees are also demanding from their employers that they want to be supported uh, uh, in their employee well-being journey so i think these are some of the things that are coming together and our projection is in the future employee well-being will be a key component of what differentiates one employee employer versus others and the second prediction for us is that it's it will no longer be a benefit that companies provide but it will be a skill that uh, managers and leaders in the organization will be trained on and you know that will be considered as a core skill that they have to develop as they grow in the organization so i think that's a big one that you know looking at mental health not as a benefit that is offered you know that you can have an employee assistance program etc but it's going to become a skill and i like the difference that when you start uh, training the managers to look out for these signs um then you know it's really something which is trainable and become part of uh, the organization's agenda to drive this conversation um right and the obvious question to then ask is you know what are the big signs of uh, uh, trouble what are the big signs of well-being issues that uh, managers uh, are trained to look out for right abhijit i i would turn the question around a little bit and say uh, if you are waiting for the big signs it's probably already too late i think we have to look mm. out for the small signs uh, the small signs of distress the small signs of uh, Uh, emotional uh, you know turmoil the small signs that managers should be trained to identify flag uh, offer support and then point the person to the right uh, resource and uh, where, where, you know it's it's even more important in a hybrid uh, culture like work space, work culture like this because it's not easy to pick up this cue so how do we train your teams your managers to identify these small signs becomes extremely important and that's where i think this this entire approach of building capacity building the skills come in very handy yeah i i i really like the way you phrased it that it's not the big signs that you look out for because if you look out for the big signs um it's probably too late you have to look out for the small signs so that there is time enough to step in and make an intervention so um you know the small sign could be a shift in performance a shift in the level of engagement uh, you know and one big parameter that i would sort of bring to the forefront is uh, the dropping levels of engagement that people talk about and one of the manifestations is the great resignation but mm -hmm. uh, you know it's not so much uh, you know a shift um, in terms of the pay packets etc i mean i think that's really a very simplistic solution that employers are looking at there are lots of issues uh, they should be addressing and well being is yeah. certainly in my mind uh, the top place to be looking out for um one other question would be that um, you know are, are there organizations which uh, are doing this well uh, you know they are like role models and what kind of organization are these the startups who are doing it are these large organizations are these indian organizations give, you know just give me a feel of uh, what kind of um, organizations are working on this sure sure no I, i think that's an interesting question because we are seeing organizations across the board uh, becoming very serious and committed to uh, emotional well-being uh, we work with startups we work with established companies traditional organizations and also multinationals so i'll pick a few examples and just share sure. what we do um, so we work with a very fast growing startup and they came to us when they were hardly 20 people and they said we believe that well being is an important component of what we offer to our teams and we want to commit and uh, make sure that we have the systems in place so we work with them set up the entire program and the commitment came from the very top the ceo himself was uh, involved in the process but also utilized therapy counseling as a key support system and encouraged his uh, uh, team members as well to the extent that about 50% of their employees utilize our services and which is a very high engagement rate considering uh, in the global average is about 5% and the reason they work with uh, somebody like us is they believe that this is a key differentiator for them as an employer to attract talent 
uh, offering well-being support is a key differentiator. The second company that we work with is a large uh, multinational bank. Uh, they have about 4,000 uh, uh, employees in India. And they said, we are already doing enough. Uh, we have an EAP system. We have a support system for employees. But we believe the only way we will move the uh, sort of uh, level up is if we can train our key leaders as uh, well-being ambassadors. So we started working with about 100 of their employees, 100 of their managers, help them build a well-being ambassador program where they are trained to recognize the signs that we just spoke about, the small signs, how to have a conversation. You know, as a culture, we are not, we are not uh, accustomed to having this conversation about emotional well-being. We are more used to giving suggestions, ki ye karlo, wo karlo, and then you know things will be better. So how do you have a right conversation? What not to say? And then how to point them to the right professionals? So we have trained about 100 of them, and then the plan is now to train 200 more. So these 300 managers will act as a first level of contact within the organization. I have to admit that they are not going to be a substitute for mental health practitioners, but you know act as a, a first interface. The third company probably I'll share is a shipping company, a traditional shipping business where 80% of employees are on ships and uh, there's a lot of stress and tension away from home, etc. And we work with that uh, organization to build a culture of well-being. And it really started kicking, uh, picking up steam when uh, the CEO publicly committed that this is a key priority for us. We're going to participate and utilize the service. And the shift there, and this goes to your previous question, the shift there was when the CEO publicly committed, it moved from being a HR initiative to be a, becoming a business initiative. So mm -hmm. it was no longer something that the HR team had to push, but the business leader were asking these questions. How many people have been trained as well-being ambassadors? What are we doing about emotional well-being of our team? So the entire conversation and the culture changes when you know the, the push comes from the top. Is there a measurable impact on uh, the bottom line and productivity and all that? Because, you know, businesses always like to, um, uh, you know, see that whatever I'm doing has a direct impact on uh, the, the money in the bank. Uh, yeah. What's been your, what's your view? Yeah, I think it's too early. It's a little early for us to uh, claim this. But, you know, there are global studies to show that it, it has an impact on productivity and uh, retention, etc., but personally, I feel that if we peg it only at uh, retention, productivity, etc., I think it'll it'll be a little bit of uh, injustice. Transactional, right? transactional. Exactly. Yeah, it, it becomes transactional. Uh, things like this will pay off, uh, you know, probably in in uh, in a medium to long term. But most importantly, I think these are hygiene factors, right? I mean, uh, providing well-being support at uh, workplace is going to be the single biggest uh, support system that you can offer, uh, considering that employees might be working anywhere across the world. I mean, the, the entire concept of workplace is changing. And how do we design this around well-being will be an important conversation. So I think, uh, you know, from uh, the conversation that we had today, you know, I'm taking away a couple of different things. One, I think, is that there is an overwhelming number of uh, CEOs uh, who believe that almost 80% of the CEOs uh, in the study that I looked at um, actually say that it has an impact on productivity. Uh, you know, 94% of them have actually sought help for themselves. Uh, two, the other thing that I liked about what you said was um, that don't look out for the big signs because if it's a big sign of a breakdown or something, then it's already too late. So when you look around and you see your loved ones, you see your colleagues anywhere, this is something that you need to be able to, uh, you know, address early. And it's not a benefit. You know, traditionally, uh, you know, it's not a benefit like a, something that you do one off. It's like a bring your children to work day. It is mm. uh, something which is like a skill and you train your people and you sort of build it in the organization's culture. So I hope that um, the work that uh, you do, uh, Ashwin, in, as part of Mana Wellness, you know, I know that you're working with a number of uh, almost 50 odd companies. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm really privileged to be able to partner with you in this journey. And I hope to have many more such conversations and build that awareness. 
thank you for all that you've done and thank you so much for joining us here today on the dreamers and unicorn show thank you abhijit for having me